Good morning, church. Happy Lord's Day. So when God created the world and uh, everything in it okay, and placed Adam and Eve, he made sure that Adam and Eve had everything they needed, right? So they were adequate. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 to 30, tells us that God gave Adam and Eve dominion or rule over all the creations. So when God created Adam and Eve, he made them adequate. And when God created Adam and Eve in their image, in their likeness, it made Adam and Eve also adequate of righteousness, right? But in Genesis chapter 3, when the devil, when Satan entered and tempted them, he tempted Adam and Eve to eat and touch the fruit that was forbidden by God and said that they would not die. Satan told Adam and Eve that they would not die. He told Eve that their eyes would be opened and they would be like God, knowing good and evil. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, the devil said, you will certainly not die. The serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In John chapter 8, verse 44, it tells us about the devil, about Satan. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So the temptation of Adam and Eve, it was the first ever recorded lie in history. Okay? And it was done by Satan. Now, according to this verse, Satan is a murderer. He is a liar, the father of lies, and there's no truth in him. So lie is Satan's primary weapon against the people of God. All right. So that is what Satan perfected, the art of lie, deception. So he is good at that. So when he speaks, you won't tell a lie from the truth. He is very good at that, and he perfected that craft of lying. And most of the lies that Satan speaks to us, it appeals to our senses. And most of the time, we agree with it. All right. So just like in the case of Adam and Eve, when Satan lied to the woman, to Eve, and it appealed to her senses, and, he, and she agreed with the lies of the devil. Now, despite given everything by God, they had everything. They were adequate, adequate in all things, even in their righteousness. Now, the devil's lie creeps into their minds and to their hearts and make them realize that they were not adequate, that they were inadequate still. So one of the greatest lies of the devil is to make us feel and think that God is inadequate, that God is insufficient, and therefore we are also inadequate. We are also insufficient. And despite of this, despite of our adequacy supplied by God. And that is what the devil wants us to think. God is inadequate, so therefore we are inadequate. We are incapable. So this morning, our lesson is about this. Satan's lie. God is inadequate. Now to think and say you are incapable is a lie that Satan put into your mind. To say that you are inadequate is a lie that Satan puts into your heart. Why? 
Because that is like saying that you are only relying on your strength rather than relying on God. Rather than relying on the power and the guidance of God. Now, Satan, he doesn't want you to be dependent on God. No. He doesn't want you to go to God and ask God for help. He doesn't want you to even mention the word or the name God. Satan will have you to think that God is incapable also of helping you. All right? He wants you to be dependent on yourself. He wants you to think that you cannot depend on God for God is inadequate. So when you say, I cannot do it, you know, I cannot do it. I'm incapable. You know what? Satan will be clapping. He is clapping. Bravo! That's my son. He is clapping. And he is all happy. He is all excited. Okay. Now, when Paul said that he could do all things through Christ who strengthened him, you know what happened to Satan's heart? It was crushed. It was crushed. Because he wasn't able to get into the mind, to get into the heart of Paul. Because Paul said, I can do everything. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Now for Satan, he doesn't want to hear those words. Right? He doesn't want to hear those words. Now, let us go to some of the examples in the Bible. Let us go to Moses. The inadequacy of Moses. Well, we know the story of Moses. We know all about uh, what Moses did. He was a brave man. He was a brave man. He, he rescued, uh, during his prime, he rescued a fellow Hebrew being beaten up by, by an Egyptian. And in the process, he killed the Egyptian. And then we also learn that uh, Moses was the one who led the Israelites out of Egypt. And we also know that Moses received the Ten Commandments from God. Now, with all those things about Moses, it all started out with God rebuking Moses for his, for, for Moses felt inadequate. Now, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, but Moses asked God, who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, please, Lord, Moses replied, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and tongue. In verse 13, but Moses replied, please, Lord, send someone else. You know, at this time, Moses was 80 years old. When God talked to him, when God was calling him to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, well, probably because of his old age, he felt inadequate. Now Moses said, who am I? Lord, who am I? And number two, he said, I have never been an eloquent speaker. Meaning he was never a, per, a, a persuasive speaker. Because probably he was, uh, he said he was slow in his speech you know, and tongue. And probably he thought of being an old man. And he would probably stutter. Number three, he asked God, Lord, Send someone else. Send someone else. Now, after God, and this was after God introduced himself to Moses and made a miracle in front of Moses to the burning bush. When, when God told Moses to put his hand uh, in, inside his cloak, it turned leprous. And when he put it back again, it was restored. And when God again showed another miracle with the staff that he was holding, turned into snakes, God showed those to, to Moses, but still Moses felt inadequate. He was conveying to God, God, you choose the wrong guy. I'm, I'm not that guy, you know. Now we turn to Gideon, the inadequacy of Gideon. Okay. Another example is Gideon. When the angel of the Lord told uh, Gideon that he was uh, chosen to save the Israelites 
from the hand of the Midianites? Gideon said in Judges chapter 6, verse 15, Please, my Lord. Gideon replied, How can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest in my father's house. So Gideon doubted his ability. All right? So what he saw in him was his weakness and his inability. Okay. The inadequacy of Peter. In Matthew chapter 14. Come. This is Jesus is speaking. Come, he said. Then Peter got down of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. So this was the account of Peter when he, he, he walked on water. Now, Peter volunteered. He volunteered and asked Jesus to call him towards him and he would walk on water. Now, Jesus said, come, come. But Peter, he felt the great winds and he saw the great waves. And what happened? He became afraid. And when fear sets in, he started to sink. So what happened here? Now, seeing the waves, feeling the great winds through his body, fear engulfed Peter. Now, the question is, what causes the fear of Peter? It is actually one, self-doubt, and two, doubt in Jesus Christ. He doubted his faith. He doubted his faith that he placed upon Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ told him to come, he was walking on water. He had his faith on Jesus Christ, but when he felt the winds and he saw the great waves, fear sets in because he doubted the faith that he placed upon Jesus Christ. At first, he was so confident. Okay. Now, when he was walking on water, the test of faith came. The winds and the great waves came upon him. And immediately, immediately, the inadequacy, the, inad the inadequacy of his faith came to him. Okay. He felt that his faith in Jesus Christ was inadequate. Now, when he called out to Jesus for help to save him, you know what? That was not, uh, that was not a call of faith. When he cried to Jesus, save me, it was not out of faith. It was not out of faith. That was out of what? Desperation. He was so desperate because he, he, he thought to himself that he was about to die. So when he cried to Jesus, it was not about faith. It was about his desperate status, his desperate state that he was about to die. It was a cry of desperation, not a cry of faith. He doubted his faith in Jesus Christ. Jeremiah, for his part, self-doubt. Jeremiah had this self-doubt. He felt inadequate because he was too young. Now, the scholar suggested that when, when God talked to him, he was just in his teens. Uh, some place him around 17 years old when God talked to him. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 6, Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. Maybe he felt he lacked the, the character of being a, a, being a spokesperson uh, of God because he was too young. So that's why he said, I am too young. I do not know how to speak. So he doubted himself. So with just these few examples from the Bible, we will see the truth about the all uh, sufficiency of God after. We will see the all sufficiency of God. The lies of Satan his scheme, the lies that he fabricated and tried so hard to, to inject into our hearts and into our minds that God is insufficient and therefore there is no need 
for us of God. That is what Satan is trying to do, to put into your hearts, to put into your mind that you are incapable and that God is also incapable of helping you. In the following, we will see the all sufficiency of God. In our scripture reading, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves. Listen to this. But our sufficiency is from God. The devil doesn't want you to understand this. The devil doesn't want you to know this. That our sufficiency is from God. He wants you to think that God is incapable. He wants you to think that God is insufficient to help you in whatever problems that you are going through right now. Now, this verse echoes what Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 5, about the, the, the branches and the vine. When Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from Jesus Christ, apart, apart from God, we cannot do anything. We are capable because God made us capable. Amen. We are adequate because God made us adequate. Now, Paul acknowledged that God was the only source of his sufficiency, that God was the only source of his adequacy. He was able to do all his ministerial work because God made him capable. It is through God that uh, Paul was able to survive, was able to endure all those that he went through, all those that he suffered. It is because of God. He was able to withstand all those sufferings and trials because Paul said God's grace was sufficient for him. God's power was made perfect in his weakness. So in the event, Paul gives all the glory to God. And Paul understood that the servant of God can do whatever God asks him to do because our adequacy it's not from ourselves, but from God. When God called you to be his servant, and when you accepted the role of God's uh, servant, God had given you the ability to be that person. He equipped us with everything that we need so that we will be adequate in serving him and preaching the gospel. Now remember, Apostle Paul, okay, with uh, even uh, how daunting the task of Paul, you know, going to the Gentile world and preaching to the Gentiles. He said that I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. Now, when you read the book of Philippians, Paul was in prison. He was in prison. And despite of that, the book of Philippians, they say, was a book of joy. Because despite being in prison, despite of all the sufferings of Paul, it was a message of joy. It was a message of hope. And look at what Paul said. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Now to see the sufficiency of God in you, number one, we must see beyond your inadequacy. Now in those great men of the Bible that we just uh, presented a while ago that I shared with you, what they saw in them was their inadequacy. They felt short. They felt incapable. They had this self-doubt. They saw their insufficiency. They saw their weakness, even though God was telling them they were not, even though God is the one calling them. What they saw is their weakness for us to see the adequacy of god we must see beyond our inadequacy now when god was calling moses moses said again lord who am i send somebody else gideon said lord we are the weakest in the clan and i am the youngest 
Jeremiah said, I am too young and I cannot speak properly. You know, that is what Satan wants us to see, our weaknesses. Now, he bombarded us with so much thoughts that we are not capable, that we don't have the skills, and that we are inadequate in whatever that we do. Now, those great men, they still felt inadequate even though God was directly commissioning them, even though God was telling them, go, I am with you. And that's how Satan worked his scheme. All right. Now, in order for us, for you and I, to defeat that scheme of Satan, we must go beyond. And we must see beyond our inadequacy, our weaknesses, to see the omnipotence of God. We must see beyond our weaknesses. And this is where discipline of the Lord comes in. Remember, in our uh, study about the Lord's discipline, the concept of discipline is a father guiding, uh, teaching, correcting, rebuking his young son to achieve what? To achieve proper maturity, to achieve proper development for that young son. Now, in all of our examples, the Lord is putting his discipline upon them. Moses was 80 years old. But he acted immature. He did not see the omnipotence of God. So the Lord, in all of them, disciplined them. Moses was disciplined by God when God's anger grew upon him. And God guided him. Part of discipline is guiding. Guidance. So God guided him, guided Moses, and taught Moses through his brother Aaron. Gideon, he was guided by God. And told Gideon, surely I will be with you in Judges chapter 6. So God guided Gideon. Peter, for his part, he was rebuked by Jesus by telling Peter, you, you of little faith. So it was a discipline by Jesus Christ. Jeremiah was also rebuked by God. God told Jeremiah in 1.7, but the Lord told me, do not say, I am only a child. For to everyone I send you, you must go. And all that I command you, you must speak. You know what this verse is telling you and I? God told Jeremiah, do not think, do not say that you are only a child. Do not think that you are incapable. Do not think that you are inadequate. If God is with you, who can be against you? If you have God by your side, who can defeat you? Nobody. Nobody. So this is telling us, don't think for a moment that you are inadequate. Don't think for a moment that you are insufficient. Because when you have God, you have all that you need. Amen? You have all that you need. So God, those, those great men in the Bible, He rebuked them. He disciplined them. Seeing beyond our inadequacy is learning that our inadequacy is the lack of God in us, and therefore we are truly adequate when God is at work in us. Okay. You see, Satan wants us to rely on our own strength. Satan wants us to rely on our own ability. And when we do that, in the end, we will find out that, that, that we won't succeed in whatever we do because we don't have God in our lives. Our strength, my dear brethren and friends, is not enough. Our own doing is not enough. So the ultimate result, when we try to listen to this scheme, to this lie of the devil, our mentality would be, I am not good enough. I am not good enough. I cannot do this. And we will be stuck in that mental state of mind that we cannot do anything right. That whatever I do, I'm a failure. Because that's what Satan wants you to think. I'm a failure. I cannot beat my depression. I cannot beat my old habit. 
I cannot do this, I cannot do that, I am miserable, I am a failure. And then, finally, we will sink, just like Peter. We will sink. And you know what? The devil is happy. He is so happy. And when you sink, because you believe in him, he will be all smiling and he will tell you, gotcha. Gotcha now. Seeing beyond our inadequacy, we will see the omnipotence of God. You will see how powerful the Lord is. If we see beyond our weaknesses, we will be able to see the all-powerful God. We will see the omnipotence of God, the all-sufficiency of God. Now, knowing your weakness it's not entirely wrong. It's not wrong to know my weakness. Knowing your weakness is actually acknowledging the areas in your life that you need to develop. There's nothing wrong in knowing your weakness. I've learned when I was studying SWOT analysis, if you still remember that, S-W-O-T. Know your strength. Know your weakness. Know the opportunity. Know the threats. So knowing our weakness is not entirely wrong. That is the area where in, in your life you need to develop. Knowing your weakness suggests you need dependency on God. We need to be totally dependent on God. But thinking that you are uh, incapable and thinking that you are not able to succeed, that is what's wrong. That is what's wrong, especially when you declare yourself as a son of God, especially when you are a servant of the Lord. In Psalm 20, verse 7 and 8, some trust in chariots and others in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Amen. They collapse and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. If you put your trust to somebody else or in somebody else other than God, you will definitely fail. But when you put your trust in the Lord, the Lord said they collapse and fall, but we rise and stand firm. You know, again, with, with those people in the Bible, in our example, when they saw their inadequacy, when they see beyond that, they saw the omnipotence of God. They saw the power of God at work. You know, Moses, Gideon, and Jeremiah, after, after they have erased the thoughts that they were inadequate, they saw the power of God. They saw God's deliverance of his people. They saw how powerful God is, and they never doubted God. At first, they doubted the Lord, but when they see beyond their weaknesses, God showed them how powerful he is. And Peter, when he saw the power of Jesus, when Jesus rescued him from drowning, and when the winds and the waves stopped, it died down, what did they do? In Matthew chapter 14, verse 33, truly, you are the Son of God. They all worship him. Those who were with Peter in the boat, they all worship Jesus Christ and they all said, truly, you are the Son of God. You see, when we pass our weaknesses, when we see beyond our weaknesses, you will see how powerful God is. And you will say, truly, you are the Son of God. Truly, you are God. The all-sufficiency of God, we can see my cup overflows. In Psalm 23, verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. 
Psalm 23 verse 5 alone contains so much meaning. Now, the main meaning of Psalm 23 verse 5 is the all-sufficiency of God. Now, let me just go over the, the last statement of David when he says, My cup overflows. Now, the idea behind this word is that when you are a host uh, in a particular house, okay, your cup will be kept full at all times. The host, the host of the house will, uh, will, will serve you the finest wine, the finest drink that he has in his home. And your cup will be kept full at all times. He will be watching you or his servants will be watching your cup so that every time they will put wine, they will put water onto your cup so that your cup overflows. A few days ago, I was having uh, my, my breakfast at the diner somewhere. I'm drinking my coffee. Then the staff, he, will, he, was, he would always go to, my, uh, to where I am and pour in coffee. And then after a while, when my coffee is half filled, he would all, again go there and fill my cup. You know? And that is what uh, that David is telling us. Our cup overflows. It was an act of what? Generosity. It was an act of generosity. Okay. If you have God, you will always have enough because God is enough for you. But you know what? Satan wants you to think that you don't have enough. He wants you to think that, that you don't have enough and that what you have is still inadequate. It is still not enough for you, not enough for your family. He wants you to think that God is shortchanging you. He wants you to think that God is making life hard for you. He wants you to think that God's provision for you is not enough because God is not enough. That is what the devil wants all of us to think. That you have so many bills to pay. So you better work. The devil is whispering to your ear. You better work. Even on Sunday, you better work. Work overtime. Now when Sunday comes, your only day off, the devil would whisper to your ear, Oh, take your time. You're so tired from Monday to Saturday. You're so tired. You only have Sunday for you to, to rest for your family. See, that's what the devil is whispering to you. It's your siesta time. Take your much needed sleep. Don't wake up early. You know, that's what Satan wants you to think. And that's what he wants you to do. All right. Now, remember at the beginning, I told you that the scheme of Satan, it appeals to us. And rightly so. When the devil whispers to your ear, take your rest. Oh, yes, I will take my rest. I was so tired Monday to Saturday. Hey, you're right. I will take my rest. You see, it appeals to your senses. And that's what the scheme of the devil is. It appears to be right, but it's wrong. And that's what devil perfected, the art of lying to us. He will tell you, you better sit down. You're tired. Watch the TV all day. You go see a movie. Relax. <laughs> okay. But let's be honest to God. Did God ever shortchange us? Let's be honest to God. Often, we complain about not having this, not having that. It seems like we lack so many things and God is not being fair to us. Let's be honest with God. Now, I want you to do this. I want you to do this. List down or just think for a moment. Think of what you list down or think of what you need that you don't have. Okay? Think of what you need that you don't have. Okay. Think of what you need that you don't have and list it down. And 
list down all the things that you have. Think of what you need that you don't have and list down all the things that you have. Now, here is the realization part. This is interesting. The realization, my realization is this. I survived. I survived up to this point, living my life with all the things that I have without the need for what I think I need that I don't have. Did you get my point? Can I, have, can I hear an amen? So now I have my amen corner right here. <laughs> you see? So therefore, so therefore, with that in mind, I have everything I need. Right? And tomorrow, I still have everything that I need. Right? So therefore, I am adequate. So therefore, I have enough blessings from God making myself adequate. And there's more. There's always more. There's more. As I have said, I still have what I need to survive tomorrow. Therefore, my cup overflows. Amen. My cup ever overflows. Philippians 4.19 And my God will supply every need of yours according to who? To you? No. According to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now here's the best part. According to you, you need these things that you don't have, according to you. Lord, I need this. But according to God, you, you, you all have what you need to survive. But according to you, you need this. But you are surviving. You survive yourself until now. And until tomorrow, you have what you need. So God is telling you, you don't need those. I am telling you, what you have is sufficient for you because I am sufficient. When you have me, you have enough. And when you have me, your cup overflows. You will still have what you need tomorrow. You don't need what you do not have. Amen. So my cup overflows. When you desire something and when you use your abilities, when you have that desire that is not for God, and you use yourself and your abilities for your own selfish gain or desire, and not for the glory of God, you will always want, want, and want. It's a never-ending want. And guess what? You will never be satisfied. You will continue to be inadequate. You will be like a man so thirsty for water that you will only have just a drop of water that won't quench your thirst. And you just keep on wanting, longing for more water. And it becomes a curse for you. You will never be satisfied. You will be also like a man who wants to have a good night's sleep but won't have it because your mind is so busy thinking about how to to gain more wealth. Your mind is so busy thinking about how somebody might break into your house and kill you and steal your wealth. You won't have peace of mind. But if you use your life, if you use your abilities, your resources for God's glory, you will be adequate. Listen to what God said. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry. Amen? Who amongst you are hungry today? <laughs> Later. <laughs> but listen. But he denies. He refuses. He rejects the craving of the wicked. See? 
If you are a wicked, God will not satisfy you. But if you are a righteous person, the Lord said, you will never be hungry. The truth is, my dear brethren and friends, we have ears that listen to lies than listen to the truths of God. We have eyes that often see other people's blessing and sell them our own. We have hearts that are often jealous of others and sell them contented. We have hands. We have hands that are open, often begging and desiring for more, but always close in blessing others. We have feet that are too fast to run to God when we are in dire need, but are too slow to come to worship Him. We have lips that are quick to complain. Lord, I don't have this, I don't have that. But seldom declare thanksgiving. Now, brethren and friends, the truth is God is enough for you. If you truly have God in your life, you are adequate. For you have the source of all blessings. For it was not by the sword that they took the land. Their arm did not bring them victory. It was by your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face. Because you favored them. It's not about you. It's about God. Now, all our lives, it's always been God helping us, providing for us, supplying us for all that we need. And with God, Paul said in Romans 8, that we are more than conquerors. The gospel is yours, my dear brethren and friends. I hope that we will dwell in the sufficiency of God and we will say to Satan, I am adequate, I am sufficient because I have God and God is enough for me. If anybody here who have not yet accepted the Lord, we ask you and encourage you to come forward. Repent of your sins, wash your sins away by being immersed through water, through baptism, so that you may have the forgiveness of your sins. Shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation? Good morning.